Right, hopefully you're with us for the uh, live stream. Uh, I've just been told as I'm adjusting my tie uh, at the start of the video, but uh, it's all good if you're here with us at six o'clock. Um, well done to be here uh, because um, I know it's been tiring. Uh, as you can probably see by my haggard face, I'm pretty tired out by this point as well. Uh, I'm going through the stress of the exams uh, just like you guys, and I appreciate all the effort you've put in up to this point. I know we've all been working really hard, uh, I know you've said the live streams have been helpful. Um, I know you've had English and maths exams, so it, this is really the final push up to the uh, up to the finish line. Um, your C2 exam and your P2 exam count for 25% each, so that's 50-50% of your overall additional science GCC in the next couple of days. And then uh, after that, you can look forward to a 10-12 week uh, holiday where um, I'm sure you've got plans to do some good stuff during that time. So. Uh, Keep that in sight as your end goal, and uh, let's get through this, these last couple of exams. And I know some of you have history and maybe childcare as well over the next few days. Let's get through these exams together, and um, let's uh, get the best possible result that we all deserve, because I know you've put in a lot of hard work, and uh, as I say, this is the last uh, push to the line, if you like. So for C2, we're going to go through as much of the topics as we can cover. Um, we're going to go through some recap of C1 first of all, uh, atoms and uh, things like that. Um, and then we're going to go into some of the C2 topics. Some of the big topics I'm really going to harp on about, such as uh, structure and bonding, uh, structure and properties. Uh, these are really big topics in C2, so come up a lot. Um, and uh, also sorts and electrolysis, we'll talk a fair bit about that because I know it's one of the last topics many of you covered. Um, so it's one that perhaps should be fresh in your head, but again, it's a topic that they seem to like to ask questions about, so definitely one we'll go over. In terms of calculations, we'll go over a few types of calculations, some of the most common ones, uh, and I'm going to leave some of the, the, the different ones, some of the harder ones till the end, and we'll come back to, we'll, we'll come full circle and come back to. Um, just going to start my timer here so I know how much time we've got to go through the different topics and uh, we'll get underway. Just before we do though, I will remind you, uh, as I always do, uh, we've got communications at folksacademy.com for any questions you want to ask. Uh, you can email your questions to that. And uh, also, uh, there should be the comments uh, enabled for this video, so if you've got any comments you want to put, uh, just to tell me how brilliant I'm doing, I always appreciate those comments, so uh, you can put those or any questions we can answer uh, immediately as well. So, let's get into it. So as I said, recapping some of the stuff from C1. We've seen this before lots of times, okay? We need to know our protons, neutrons and electrons. We need to know the masses of each thing. We need to know the charge of each thing. And we need to know the location of each thing. Oh, one thing I did forget to mention at the start, um, you can access the uh, PowerPoint, the slides of information on the science website. Uh, so if you want to see those because they're a bit unclear on the board, um, then you can find them there and, and go through them alongside, hopefully. So, first of all, our protons. We should know by now our protons have a mass of one. That means they, have, they, they weigh one atomic unit. Uh, their charge is p -p positive because they are p -p protons uh, and they're found in the nucleus of the atom, uh, right in the centre here. Uh, also in the nucleus we find the neutrons. Now neutrons are the tricky ones because they have no charge. They are neutral. Uh, that's why they have a charge of zero. Uh, their mass is also one, so they make up part of the mass of an atom as well as the protons. And they are also found in the nucleus. So both these subatomic particles, the protons and the neutrons, found in the nucleus. Then we have our electrons, where we have to say the mass is almost zero. Uh, that mass, you can't say zero or nothing, you have to say almost zero. And the charge of an electron is minus one. Now, electrons are found in these shells whizzing around the outside uh, of the nucleus. Uh, and that's the structure of the atom. Like I say, it's a recap of core C1, but it is something that can come up in C2 as well. So we need to know that and be clear on it. With that, uh, we need to be able to calculate some different things so we can find the number of protons, electrons and neutrons uh, from the elements using the periodic table. So you'll get one of these in the exam, uh, it'll be two-sided, have the periodic table on one side, have the data sheet on the other, uh, which has the reactivity series and some common ions you get down the bottom. 
Uh, this is probably the most useful bit, but these bits can come up as well in certain questions. So once we've found our periodic table, which we'll be provided with, we can find different elements on it. This is chlorine over here, so this is chlorine. Um, it has two numbers by it. So you've got chlorine, symbol CL, uh, and it has a, a smaller number and a bigger number. And we should recognise by now that the smaller number down the bottom is called the atomic number. This is the atomic number, or sometimes called the proton number as well. It's called the proton number, or sometimes called the proton number, because it literally tells us the number of protons that are in the nucleus. Uh, up the top, the bigger of the two numbers, uh, is your mass number. That tells you the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And if we use that information, we can actually calculate the number of neutrons by using the atomic number and the mass number, which we'll go through. So this is chlorine. Find it in the periodic table along with the other elements. Find its uh, mass and atomic number. And then doing some calculations, you can work out some different bits. So the number of protons, as I said, is equal to the atomic number. In the case of chlorine here, we've got 17. So our Atomic number is 17, uh, so the number of protons is 17. For any element, okay, any element is neutral, and that's because it also, the atomic number tells us the number of electrons, so it has 17 electrons. That is important for doing the electronic structure uh, and doing different types of bonding that we'll come on to. Because it has the same number of protons and electrons, that means the overall charge on an element is zero, because they cancel each other out. Okay? Same number of protons and electrons cancel each other out. Number of neutrons can be found by doing a simple sum, by doing the mass number, which is always the larger of the two numbers, subtract the atomic number. So mass number, subtract atomic number. Uh, in the case of chlorine here, this chlorine we've got, uh, it has a... Mass number of 35, an atomic number of 17, and uh, if we subtract 17 from 35, we get 18. So it has 18 neutrons. Um, the board is being a bit funny, so the colour goes a bit blue at times. I'm trying to adjust it uh, as we go, but hopefully it will stay there and that will be easier to see. Uh, but that's the problem it's having. Also, it did come up in C1 actually, this little bit of information, but it's something that definitely could come up again in C2. There's no reason since they touched on it in C1, they won't touch on it again in C2. Um, isotopes. Now, isotopes are, definition, an element with the same number of protons, because the number of protons tells us what element it is. If you have atoms of, with the same number of protons, they are the same element. Uh, the number of electrons could be different, but in the case of isotopes, it is the number of neutrons that are different. Uh, with this one, you can see that the mass number has changed. This is chlorine 37. This is chlorine 35. Um, if we counted or calculated the number of uh, neutrons in this, we'd have to do 37, the mass number, subtract 17, the atomic number, to give us 20. That tells me there's 20 neutrons in this chlorine, and there's 80 neutrons in this chlorine. Hence, they are isotopes. Same number of protons, different number of neutrons. That's what an isotope is. Also, this is a slide directly taken from the C1 uh, presentation that I did. Electronic structure. You could be asked to draw the electronic structure of different atoms, uh, just like uh, in the C1 exam. Now, don't miss these questions. They will give you uh, the rings, the shells, to put the electrons on. And uh, you need to make sure that you, first of all, find the number of electrons that that element has. How can you do that? By looking at the atomic number. That tells us the number of electrons. And then, uh, apologies for the sound. That's just the window shutting. I might just wait till uh, it's finished so you can hear me particularly at that point. There we go. Thank you. Right, so we found the number of electrons by looking at the atomic number, and then once we've found that, we can actually use the 288 rule to uh, draw the electronic structure. That means there's two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second shell, eight in the third shell, 
and then any that are left over go into the fourth shell. We just fill that up. We can check we're correct by, again, using the periodic table, and this is important. The group numbers at the top tell us the number of electrons in the outer shell. I can tell that potassium, K, is correct because it's here in group 1, uh, and it has one in its outer shell, one electron in its outer shell. If its outer shell was full, it would be unreactive, it would not react. But in this case, potassium, only having one in its outer shell, is very reactive. Elements in group 1 are called the alkali metals. They are incredibly reactive because they have one electron in their outer shell. Group 7 is actually called the halogens, and they are also reactive uh, because they have seven in their outer shell and want to gain another one. Group 0 has a full outer shell. They're called the noble gases, and they are actually unreactive because they are full outer shells and they're already uh, happy and balanced, if you like. So, that was the core recap. Now, I'm going to jump into some chemical calculations work because... Uh, we've talked about the masses of protons and neutrons. We've talked about calculating the number of neutrons using the mass number, subtracting the atomic number. So I feel it's appropriate to go into calculating. And this is a topic that a lot of us find hard because we think, oh, it's maths and what's it doing with science? But unfortunately, science is the application of maths. So we need to be able to use those skills uh, to do some work in chemistry and particularly in physics, as I'm sure you know. A couple of definitions that we need to know. The relative atomic mass, and it's very important you recognise the symbol for that is A with a little subscript R by it. AR, relative atomic mass. It is the mass of an element as compared to carbon-12. Now, they don't ask that often, but it's compared to carbon-12, it's relative to carbon-12. Uh, could be a little thing that could come up. Uh, carbon-12 is a particular isotope of carbon. So it's the mass of an element, and it can be found straight from the mass numbers in the periodic table. I can go to any element on this, look at sodium, the mass number is 23, its mass, its relative atomic mass, AR, is 23. The formula mass, the relative formula mass, given the symbol M with a little subscript R, is a, a bit more tricky to do, but we'll go through a few examples just to see exactly how to do it. It is the mass of a compound which is found by adding together all the elements that make up that compound. Okay? And a couple of examples are the best way to show that. Uh, we've got magnesium chloride here. So magnesium chloride is MgCl2. Now, often in exam papers these days, they give you, in brackets, the relative atomic masses you need to use uh, in the question. If they don't, for whatever reason, you can always find it in the periodic table, but generally they give you them in the question. So for this compound, we would have something like brackets, Mg equals 24, uh, and Cl equals 35.5, in brackets after the question. So they're giving you that information. Then we just need to do the calculation. Now, these two elements being next to each other, as in Mg Cl2, uh, actually means you add them together, you add together the masses of the different elements you've got. There is no number after the Mg. The numbers after the elements mean you multiply that element by the number that's provided. So in this case, chlorine is going to be multiplied by 2. So for this one, you've got magnesium, which is 24. I'm going to put this extra step in, but it's kind of unnecessary in this example, but it's good just to show the complete method. 24 multiplied by, now there's no number after the magnesium, so that must mean there's just one magnesium in there. So if we put that 24 times 1, that's the magnesium. Plus, and then I'll put the mass of chlorine, which I've been given, 30, 35.5, uh, is my mass of chlorine, and multiply it by 2, because there's 2 outside of the, or after the chlorine. Okay? Then I'll do the multiplications in the brackets first, so 24 times 1 is 24, plus 35.5 times 2 is 71. Okay? Then I've got my final sum to do, just to add the two numbers, tells me that the mass of that is 95. 
Okay? That's how you calculate the relative formula mass of uh, a compound such as magnesium chloride. Another quick example I wanted to look at was calcium hydroxide because it's got a little bit of a compound in the brackets and a number outside. So just like with maths, as I'm sure you're aware, you do the brackets first. So in this case, they would give you the information that the mass of calcium is equal to uh, 40, the mass of oxygen is equal to 16, and the mass of hydrogen is equal to 1. They'll probably provide you that in the question, but if they don't, uh, you would have your periodic table, you could find those elements in there. Then, to do your sum, to work out the relative formula mass of calcium hydroxide, which is that, the first thing I would start with is doing the sum in the brackets. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to start just there. Oxygen, the mass is 16, and there's only one in the brackets, so times it by one. Plus hydrogen, the mass is one, there's only one of them in the brackets, so times it by one. Okay? This is just calculating what is in the brackets, first of all. If I do that, 16 times 1 is 16, plus 1 gives me 17. So the hydroxide bit, the O and the H, have a mass of 17. Then I need to realise, once I've done that first, just like in maths, that there's actually two lots of what's in the bracket. So I need to times that by 2. And to that, I'm going to need to add my calcium, which is going to be times by 1, because there's only one calcium atom, because there's no number after it. That would lead me to 40 times 1 is 40 still, plus 17 times 2 is 34. Okay. My final sum is going to be 40 plus 34, giving me a mass of 74. Okay. So my relative formula mass of calcium hydroxide is 74. Now you'll be given a calculator in the exam, so you'll be able to use that to do these sums. So definitely do them on the sum, don't try to do them in your head as I've just done, have that tool, use that tool, uh, it's there for you, so do the sum on, on, on the calculator if you're, well, even if you're sure, even if you've done it in your head, check it on the calculator afterwards, make sure the numbers add up, okay? So that is calculating the relative formula mass of a compound, you just add the masses up of the different elements, making sure you multiply by the number afterwards, uh, after the element it comes, or doing the brackets first if it's got a part of the compound in brackets. Generally, following those type of questions where you have to calculate the relative formula mass, they have a calculation of what's called the percentage mass of an element in a compound. Okay, And you won't be given this formula, but the calculation you need to carry out is the percentage mass is equal to the atomic masses of the element they're asking, multiplied by the number of atoms of that element there are, divided by the formula mass of the compound, which you've probably worked out in the previous step, times 100 to get it as a percentage. Okay? So if we had a question such as calculate the percentage mass of chloride in magnesium chloride, generally this would be following our calculation we did previously, to work out the formula mass of magnesium chloride. Okay, so we've done that part, we've worked out the formula mass, 95, that was part one. And then the second part of this question, we want the percentage mass of chlorine. Now, as I said, we want the atomic mass to do this, so percentage mass is equal to the atomic mass of the element, which is chlorine, so again we've got it there, 35.5 multiplied by the number of atoms of chlorine. Well, it's Cl2, so we've got two atoms, divided by the mass of the compound, or the formula mass of the compound, which we calculated in the previous part as 95, times 100 to get it as a percentage. That will give me 71 over 95, times 100. Uh, now my maths is fairly decent, but I can't do that one just in my head. I could use a calculator to do it. You could perhaps try that if you're watching this, but uh, I'm going to leave it at that stage. That's just the calculation I would need to do uh, to, to finish it off. 
Uh, it's going to be around sort of 70% just above, uh, really. So, so that's what we're looking at in terms of uh, percentage mass. So it's the formula mass, sorry, the atomic mass of the element. This is about chlorine times the number of atoms divided by the formula mass of the compound times 100 to get it as a percentage. The last thing I'll say about mass before I move on, these are the most common calculation type questions. You can get asked a few more, such as reacting mass calculations and uh, empirical formula, which if I have time I'll go through at the end. But uh, what I'll suggest, if you really want to know about those, then please write a comment uh, and ask me, and I might get quicker to them if we get a few comments in asking about those two techniques, reacting mass or empirical formula. Or alternatively, I'll be in early tomorrow, so you can come and see me. I'll probably be in this room 104 again. Uh, you can come and see me from, from 7 o'clock to ask me to go through that technique with you uh, if you want to know if I don't get a chance tonight. But I'll leave it to the end and see if we have time. Um, the last thing I'm going to say before moving on to bonding, different types of bonding, is this formula mass, what this tells us, if you are asked about uh, moles, which is a, a weird thing, we're not talking about the furry rodent, but it's a chemical measure, it's, uh, it's actually, if you know the formula mass of a compound, the mass of one mole is just that mass in grams. That would be one mole of magnesium chloride. Okay. So if it does ask you, which it comes up occasionally, about what the mass of a mole is, uh, it's just the relative formula mass in grams. Now a good tip here is, if you get a question where you've done a calculation in part one, and then the next question has asking you for a number but it doesn't give you any space to work it out. It just literally gives you uh, a little bit of a little line to write your answer with one mark by it. It's probably a good safe bet is it's just the number you've answered the previous question with. It will be the same number. So just write it in, even if you're not sure. And if you couldn't do the previous question, write any answer down in there. 10, 1, I don't care. And then put it on that line as well for the second part. And you can get error carried forward marks for that. Uh, you can move on, even if you couldn't do the original calculation. So, that's it on calculations for now, unless we get some real questions coming. Uh, I will maybe get to it at the end, empirical formula and uh, reactive mass. But otherwise, I really need to move into bonding, because bonding is a huge topic, uh, and it comes up lots and lots. It's all to do with the three different types of bonding you can get, the four different types of structures you can get around that and what their properties are like and being able to describe them. Okay? So the three types of bonding we're going to talk about are ionic bonds. Now, ionic bonds occur between a metal and a non-metal. And it is where electrons are transferred. That means they are given from one uh, atom to another. It's always the metal which gives up its electrons uh, and it's always the non-metal that joins that gains its electrons. Okay? Then, the other type of bonding we'll move on to is covalent bonding. This is formed between a non-metal and another non-metal. Can be two of the same non-metals, such as in oxygen, which is O2, oxygen atom, bonded with an oxygen atom. Or, it can be between two different elements, uh, such as this, which is ammonia, which is nitrogen, joined with Hydrogen, in fact, three hydrogen atoms. Um, and we'll look at how we do the, the dot and cross diagrams, which is what this is called uh, for that. In that, though, that's a friendly type of bonding. Covalent is very friendly. They share electrons. Everyone's happy. Everyone gets a full outer shell by sharing the electrons between the atoms. And then last of all, the third type of bonding is called metallic bonding. It occurs in substances that are made of only uh, metallic elements. Okay? Um, it could be a pure metal, just one metal, or it could be a mixture of metals. And we'll come on to it, but if we have a mixture of metals, it's called, I'm sure you probably know, an alloy. The structure of it is not where electrons are shared or transferred, but it's this sort of structure we'll come back to, which is a 
rows or layers of positive ions surrounded by what we call a sea of delocalized electrons. Delocalized is the fancy scientific word for free, so free electrons, they're free to move. But I promise we'll come back to that and go into it in a bit more detail. Three types of bonding then we need to know, ionic between metals and non-metals, covalent between non-metal and non-metal, and metallic, which is just occurs in pure metals or mixtures of metals. Ionic bonding. So when we do ionic bonding, you may be asked to draw out the bonding that occurs in an ionic compound, such as sodium chloride. They may ask you to draw the electronic structures of the elements. This is the elements before they have bonded. This is uh, sodium, Na. It has 11 electrons. So two in the first shell, eight in the second, and one left over to go in the third. It's clearly not happy because it doesn't have a full outer shell. Chlorine has uh, 17 electrons. It has two in the first, eight in the second, and then seven in its third shell. Again, it is not happy because it wants a full outer shell, and it's one short of that. These two make a perfect pair. Okay, this is in group 1 and this is in group 7 and they often are used as an example of an ionic bond because they bond well together. Sodium has one electron in its outer shell that it doesn't really want. It wants to have a full outer shell so it can give that electron away. Chlorine is one short of having a full outer shell. It's got 7, it wants 8. So the thing that occurs in ionic bonding between this metal, sodium, and non-metal chlorine is that electron is given to the chlorine atom. So sodium loses its outer shell electron and chlorine picks up the outer shell electron. It is shown by this cross appearing over on the chlorine. The cross was over here on the sodium, it's now with these dots on the chlorine atom. This is how we show an ionic compound or an ionic bond using a dot and cross diagram. Really important, you probably can't see on the camera, to show is the sodium when it loses its electron you put square brackets around it and outside of the uh, square brackets you put its charge now electrons remember are negative okay so electrons are negative so if I'm to lose an electron if I'm to give it away that would make me more positive if I was to lose my negative feelings I'm going to feel more positive so if I lose a negative electron I'm going to feel more positive, so I become positive. And in this case, it's plus one. You can put the one on it uh, because it's lost just one electron. Whereas chlorine has gained an electron. It has received an electron. It's got something that's negative. So it's actually going to be more negative. And in this case, negative one because it's gained one electron. Okay? They occasionally ask, how does the bonding occur between sodium and chlorine? Okay, or magnesium and chlorine, or magnesium and fluorine. Okay? The metal is always the substance to lose electrons. Now, if it was magnesium, it's in group two, so it's got two in its outer shell. So the easiest way to answer those questions is to say it loses two electrons to become magnesium two plus. Whereas if we were talking about, let's say, fluorine, fluorine is in group seven, so it wants to gain an electron. So fluorine gains an electron to become fluorine 1 minus, or minus 1. Okay, that's describing what's going on in the bonding. Okay? So that's what the bonding looks like. Now, it's very important that you know the properties of ionic compounds. That's the bonding, that's what occurs. Electrons are given from the metal element, it becomes positively charged, to the non-metal element, which becomes negatively charged. You need to know what these substances, sodium chloride, which is commonly referred to as salt, uh, normal table salt, but salts are just ionic compounds, uh, you need to know what they're like. And their properties are, they have a giant ionic lattice. A giant ionic lattice means it's a regular arrangement of positive and negative ions, which are joined together. Um, the shape is actually 3D, it will go backwards and forwards, and it's giant because it's huge. It's made up of thousands, if not millions, of atoms, all linked together. Because of this, because it's a giant ionic compound, it's crystalline. It forms crystals, because giant ionic lattices, regular shapes. A lattice is a regular crisscross shape. Regular crisscross shape. And it forms crystals because of that. 
It also is held together by strong electrostatic forces. That's the attraction between the positive and negative ions. It's called an electrostatic force. You can talk about it in terms of opposites attract. Okay, so opposites attract. And those electrostatic forces, those opposite attractions, are really strong. So they mean ionic compounds have high melting and boiling points because it takes a lot of energy to overcome that opposites attracting, that electrostatic force, and break up the lattice. And it does not conduct electricity when it's solid because all these ions are locked in position, but it does conduct or do conduct electricity when they're molten or in solution. Molten means if you heat it up enough it will melt, even though the melting point and boiling point are high, it will melt and when then the ions are free to move and it can carry electricity. Also, if you dissolve it in water, it will carry electricity because the ions are free to move about. So those are the important properties of ionic compounds. Okay? They're crystalline because they have a giant ionic lattice. They have high melting and boiling points because they have strong electrostatic force and it's a giant ionic lattice, giant being huge. And it does not conduct electricity when it's solid because it's locked, all the ions are locked in position, but when it's molten or in solution, the ions are free to move and therefore it conducts electricity. So that's ionic compounds. What ionic bonding looks like you can use diagrams to answer questions, so if you can draw these diagrams, if a question asks you to describe what happens when magnesium bonds with chlorine, you can draw the diagrams to show it, as long as you get the diagrams correct, or you can talk about magnesium losing electrons and chlorine picking up or gaining electrons. On to covalent bonding. Okay, we've had about half hour. We have had a question come in. It's been answered directly by uh, Miss Walker, who's uh, the little typer in the background answering your questions that come in. Um, but if you have any more, please do, please do ask him. And if it's a big question, we'll go through it uh, on the board over here. If it's a small question, we can answer it quickly uh, over there. Um, but in terms of covalent bonding, there's two types of covalent substances you need to know. There are simple molecules. Okay, simple molecules are made up of only a few atoms joined together. And then there are giant structures. And there are only four giant structures you will come across at GCSE. They are diamond and graphite, and they are the main two. Um, and I'll go into a bit more detail on those. But then also silicon dioxide and fullerenes come up to a lesser extent. Uh, but they are all examples of giant structures. Okay? Simple molecules. Now, I'm not going to go too much on about simple molecules. You can draw bonding diagrams for simple molecules. In the revision guide you should have at home, you have a number of examples of simple molecules uh, and the dot and cross diagrams of them. The main point is you will be given two overlapping circles, or more than two, I should say, and it will tell you what elements are being uh, bonded in the circles by the letters. And then you need to put dots and crosses, electrons, into the diagram, either in the area between the overlapping circles, which is the bonding electrons, where they bond, or just on the rings surrounding the elements themselves. Now the first thing you need to do is identify the number of electrons in the outer shell, because in covalent bonds you only show the outer shell electrons, important. Uh, so for oxygen it's got six outer shell electrons, how can I tell? because it's in group 6 of the periodic table. I then put one electron in the bond of one hydrogen, this is for water, H2O, and I put one electron in the other side, in the other bond, and then I do the same for hydrogen. I pair it up with one electron and one electron from each hydrogen. If I've used two electrons already for oxygen, it has four remaining from its outer six. And I just put those on their own around the outside of oxygen. Hydrogen only has one electron, and if I've used that already in the bonding area, it's not got any more to put on the ring owned by itself. The last thing to check your bonding diagram is correct, cover up the other elements and look at oxygen, it should have eight electrons around it, a full outer shell. Cover up oxygen and look at the two hydrogens, now they both only have one shell, so they only want two in that shell. Do they both have two? Yes, the bonding diagram is correct. 
It's a tricky skill to do, dot and cross diagrams on uh, covalent compounds. The ones in your ravine guide tend to be the only ones they ask about. So if you remember those, you will be able to do them anyway, even if you can't quite master the technique for doing it. Okay. Properties of simple molecules. Now, they, they only ask you a few things. Simple molecules generally are a gas at room temperature. They're always a gas. And that's because they have low melting and boiling points. Very low melting and boiling points. And the reason being is they actually have weak intermolecular forces. And that's a common question. Why is hydrogen chloride, why is chlorine gas, uh, why is chlorine a gas at room temperature? And um, why is oxygen a gas at room temperature? Uh, and it's be always because it has low melting and boiling points. That's one mark. Because it is a simple molecule, two marks. And it has weak intermolecular forces, three marks. 5% of the paper in a question like that. They could also ask you about, do simple molecules conduct electricity? Um, now, simple molecules never conduct electricity. And the simple reason being is they do not have any charge. The molecules are neutral. They can't carry electricity because they have no charge. Okay? So simple molecules, there's not too much to know about it. Okay? They have low melting and boiling points because they have weak intermolecular forces. And they, they don't conduct electricity because they have no charge. The low melting and boiling points means they are gases at room temperature. Okay? That's one type of covalent structure, simple molecules. In my class, uh, generally I get them chanting this, so we remember it. Uh, we sound like a weird cult. But bonds are strong, forces are weak. Okay? That's IM forces, intermolecular forces are weak. Because the bonds holding the atoms together are strong, but... Forces holding the molecules together are weak, so it has low melting and boiling points. Bonds are strong, forces are weak. Okay? Little thing to remember if it's asking you about simple molecules. The other type of covalent structure you're going to come across uh, is giant covalent structures. The, another word for giant covalent structures is macromolecules. Macromolecules means macro is uh, big and molecules uh, molecules made up of atoms. So macromolecules mean giant molecules or giant covalent structures. But that's another name for them and they can ask you that. They're called macromolecules. First thing to know about them is all of them have extremely high melting and boiling points. And we can tell that quite quickly because they are giant. And giant means huge, okay, massive. And covalent means they have strong covalent bonds between them. Because they're giant, made up of loads of atoms joined together, and all of those atoms are joined by strong bonds. Remember, bonds are strong. It's forces that are weak in, in covalent substances. Uh, because these bonds are really strong, it means the melting points of diamond, graphite, silicon dioxide, and fullerenes are really high. Okay? Now in exams, they like to get you to compare diamond with graphite. Reason being is they're both made up of carbon atoms. They're both made up of the same substance. Diamonds, one of the most precious materials, hardest materials known to man on the planet. And graphite, the thing we get used up in pencils. Okay? Graphite's the substance in pencils that leaves a mark on a page. Okay? They are made of the same, same type of atoms, same atoms, carbon. Okay? It's just their bonding that is different. Okay? In diamonds, this looks quite complex. It, you can get a simplified version given to you in exam questions. But the important bit, it, bit to remember about it is the diamond shape is the most important, really. Uh, the diamond shape, if you were to draw it out, looks like, well, my daughter would draw this. Like that. And that's because diamond has one, two, three, four strong covalent bonds. Okay? It has four strong covalent bonds to each carbon atom. And that makes it incredibly hard because those bonds are incredibly hard and it makes it really locked together with those four strong bonds. Also, diamond does not conduct electricity because it's got four bonds. But it's easier to see that when we look at graphite. So graphite is actually arranged in layers. You get layers of carbon atoms. And those layers look a little bit, if you were to look from the top, like this. They have a sort of 
shape where you have three bonds from each carbon atom going to another three. And they go round in sort of hexagons like this. Okay, that was if we were to look at the top of one of the layers of graphite. Each of the atoms of carbon in graphite has three covalent bonds. Not four, like in our diamond shape, but three. And that makes it weaker. Okay? So it's weaker than diamonds, the hardest known naturally occurring material on Earth. At least that's what we'll think of for now. Um, but graphite has three bonds, so it makes it weaker. There's still, there's still covalent bonds, so it still does have a high melting and boiling point because it's giant and it has strong covalent bonds, but it only has three instead of four. It's arranged in layers, which means these layers can break off of each other or can slip and slide over each other. This is important because it allows it to be used in pencils because when you rub your pencil across a piece of paper, uh, the layers break off and uh, the it leaves the, the carbon, the mark of carbon, on the paper. And it's those layers that are breaking away. It also allows graphite to be used as a lubricant because the layers slide if you've got a machine where the, the metal would be rubbing against each other and possibly break. You can use graphite to lubricant the joint or lubricate the joint so it slides nicely over each other and the metal doesn't wear away. That's because it's arranged in layers and the layers can slide. Now, I go back to the point I made where it only has three bonds because graphite has three bonds to each carbon atom. It actually means it has three, different word, electrons. Okay? And that's crucial. Okay? This is one of the most interesting and important properties of graphite. Because it's got free electrons, and that means free to move about, they can move about, they can carry electricity. Okay, so graphite actually conducts electricity. Because it's got three bonds, it has free electrons, and that allows it to conduct electricity. Diamond, on the other hand, has four bonds and no free electrons, so it will not conduct electricity. That's quite a common question. They ask you to compare the properties of diamond and graphite. Okay. And diamond is hard, has an extremely high melting and boiling point because it's got four strong covalent bonds, but no free electrons, so will not conduct electricity. Whereas graphite um, has three bonds, which makes it arranged in layers, which can slide over each other, so it's weaker than diamond. It still has a high melting point and boiling point because of the strong covalent bonds but it can conduct electricity because the three bonds mean it's got three electrons. I'll come back to it when we look at um, metallic bonding in a second, but um, three electrons. If you ever get a question, why does this substance conduct electricity? A pretty safe bet is to say three electrons. And you can actually get two marks for that because one for saying that it's the electrons that carry the electricity and they are free to move. So you can actually get two marks for a simple two-word answer. Why does graphite conduct electricity? It has three electrons. That could be two marks. I would expand on it a bit to say electrons carry the electricity and they are free to move. And in the case of uh, graphite, because it has three bonds, that's why it has three electrons. The other joint covalent structures I've mentioned might come up are silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide is very similar to diamond in its structure. Um, each of the silicon has four bonds. Uh, each of the oxygen in it actually has two bonds, though. Uh, but it's strong covalent bonds. It's incredibly hard uh, because of the four bonds of silicon. Uh, and it's very similar to diamond. Okay? A regular lattice, a giant structure. Uh, whereas fullerenes, okay, they're like the ball-shaped structures, uh, they are similar to graphite in many ways. They have three bonds, so they conduct electricity. And fullerenes are actually used in a delivery of drugs and in catalysts. They can be used in lubricants as well. Just to mention, there's another substance they like to bring up every now and then, which is graphene, which is essentially a single layer of graphite. 
It's because it's like graphite, it conducts electricity, but it's also strong but flexible. So they're looking to use it for things like mobile phone screens or possibly electronic newspapers, which could be folded up. Uh, so graphene. If you're thinking about graphene, think about graphite, and you won't go too far wrong. Three bonds, three electrons, conducts electricity. Okay. On to giant metallic structures. So giant metallic structures... Okay, have regular lattices or giant regular lattices. Okay, anything that's really giant, you're thinking of high melting and boiling points. So giant structures are going to lead to high melting and boiling points. It's actually arranged as a layer of positive ions surrounded by delocalized electrons or free electrons which hold the structure together. Okay, that's how you would describe it. But remember, if you're asked to describe the, the structure of a metal in an exam and you can't remember the words to do it, you can draw the diagram to show it. Label it up. These are positive ions surrounded by free or delocalized, if you want to sound really clever, electrons, which are free to move. Because it's positive ions and delocalized electrons, positive ions are positive and electrons are negative, opposites attract. And that means it's held together by electrostatic attraction. Because electrostatic attraction is really strong and hard to break, it means metals have a high melting and boiling point. Okay. It conducts electricity. And as I said, if ever you get a question about why does such and such conduct electricity, usually it's because it's got free electrons. Electrons carry the electricity and they are free to move about the structure. So that's... Metallic structures always have these free electrons, so always conduct electricity, all metals. Importantly, you can say that metals, or the structure of metal, or one of their properties, is that they can be bent and hammered into shape. It's called malleable. And it's all to do with the fact they're arranged in layers. Okay? Because they're arranged in layers, when force is applied, the layers can slide. And you can actually bend the metal, or shape the metal, because the layers can slide over each other. That's due to, as I say, these layers sliding when a force is applied. If we do not want them to be like that, we can actually make an alloy. And by making an alloy, we actually put different sized atoms into the structure of the metal. They could be smaller atoms or they could be bigger. Either way, those different sized atoms disrupt the layers. And because they disrupt the layers, they stop them being able to slide over each other. Therefore, they make it stronger. Okay? Common alloys that come up are things like steel, where they put carbon atoms in the structure of iron. Or you could get brass, which has, uh, I believe in brass, could be zinc atoms, or I always get confused with bronze or bronze. No, tin atoms in brass. But to be honest, the actual metal is not important. It's actually... Uh, the atoms that are in there are a different size to the atoms that make up the metallic structure uh, which is in brass copper, the main metal in it um, and it disrupts the layers and stops them sliding over each other okay. with an alloy there's one type of alloy that occasionally comes up called SMA which is shape memory alloy it's used in dental braces um, and it can actually change its shape dependent on the temperature uh, that it's actually in. Okay, so it can change its shape dependent on what temperature it's in. Uh, so that's an important just, just type of alloy to remember. Uh, something that can change its shape dependent on temperature. So when it's heated up, it can return to its original shape. The way it's used for braces is they can be fitted loose, and then when it warms up in the mouth, it can pull the teeth into the correct position. So that's called an SMA, a shape memory alloy. Okay, it's something that remembers its shape dependent on temperature. So that's kind of structure and bonding. We've got the, the three types uh, in there. We've got ionic, covalent, and metallic. For covalent, there's two types of structure, simple molecules and giant uh, covalent. I would suggest if you're still not sure on that, you go back, have a little review of the first uh, section of this, maybe afterwards. Uh, because it is a big topic and it comes up a lot. You need to be able to recognise the properties of ionic um, and why their structure gives them those properties. 
the properties of covalent, simple and giant and how their structures are linked to that. And then last of all, uh, metallic and how its structure is linked to its properties. It has free electrons so it conducts electricity. It has strong electrostatic forces so it has high melting and boiling points. It's arranged in layers so it can be bent or moulded into shape. It's malleable. I'm going to jump into acids and bases. Acids and bases is another big topic and there's some real key points that I can give you that will help you do uh, some of the basics with it. The pH scale shown here is used to measure how acidic with low pHs or alkali with high pHs a substance is. Okay? If you've got a pH of around 2, it's acidic. Now the colours here, you go down towards red, uh, neutral is green and it starts to get sort of yellowy, orange and then red as you go down and alkali will start to, it's not very clear on the board, but start to go bluey and then get to a dark sort of purple colour as it gets up to pH 14. Really important is that you remember all acids release H plus ions when they are dissolved in water. So if you ever put an acid into water, what makes it an acid uh, at this stage is the fact that it releases H plus ions. Okay, when, it's, when it's dissolved in water, when it's added to water, it will release H plus ions. So if you ever get a question, usually only one mark, that says what makes this solution acidic? It's H plus ions, the answer it's looking for. Similarly, alkalis. Now alkalis are where you dissolve a base in water. A base is the opposite to an acid. It will neutralise an acid. If you dissolve a base in water, if it dissolves in water, you call it an alkali. And when you dissolve that alkali in water, it actually releases OH minus ions. You can put the negative, the minus, on the other side, but technically it should be on the oxygen. You can write this the other way around. You could write HO minus. Okay? But either way, you need to know that all alkalis release OH minus when they're placed into water. All acids, H+. Plus. So those are the ions that are released by acids and alkalis. Now, if you add an acid to an alkali, I'm sure you can tell me that they neutralise each other. Uh, it's called a neutralisation reaction. And the reason it's a neutralisation reaction is you can show an ionic equation, the simplest ionic equation for an acid and an alkali added together, or an acid and a base, is this. H plus from the acid plus OH minus from the alkali. If you put that together, you end up with two hydrogens and one oxygen, which the student, uh, the student among you will probably recognise is H2O. Okay? Water. And water, pure water, has a pH of 7. So we've actually neutralised the acid and the alkali by adding them together in the same quantities to make H2O, water. Okay, it's a neutralisation reaction. All acids release H+, all alkalis release OH-. Acids, to taste, generally taste sour. Alkalis are used in making soaps uh, and cleaning products, usually. You need to know how to make a salt. And there's three ways you, you can make a salt. And all of these are linked to acids and alkalis because uh, some of the methods actually rely on you mixing those two. I said earlier that a salt is just a scientific name. We use it for like table salt, which is sodium chloride, but really it's just a general name for an ionic compound. An ionic compound is called a salt. Now, the salts we can make, we can actually do in three ways. By adding a metal to an acid. If we add a metal to an acid, we actually make a salt and hydrogen gas is produced. That is, if you add a metal to an acid, you get a salt and hydrogen gas released. You can make a salt by adding an acid to a base, or instead of a base, an alkali. Remember, an alkali is just a base when it's dissolved in water. So an acid plus a base gives you salt and forms water. We know that because... When we put our alkali into water, we'll get OH minus, the acid will give us H plus, so it must make water. And then last of all, you could make a salt by adding an acid to a carbonate. Uh, and with that carbonate, this one is more tricky, you actually get your salt produced, 
You get water, because carbonates are actually bases or alkali. Uh, and you produce carbon dioxide as well. Carbon dioxide gas is given off in that process. Okay. So those are the three ways to make a salt. Now, you can actually tell what salt you're going to make from the combination of uh, acid and alkali that you actually have. So, in terms of what you need to know with regards to that, the, the metal, the first name of the salt, comes from whatever metal you've got added to your acid or at the start of your base. So some base or alkalis we use are, for example, sodium hydroxide. That's a really common alkali. Okay. Which is a really common alkali. If we were to use that as our alkali uh, that we were making a salt with, the name of the salt, the first bit, would start with sodium. Okay, it would start with sodium because that is the metal in the substance. If it was magnesium hydroxide, it would have magnesium at the start of the name of the salt. The second part of the name of the salt comes from what acid? And there's a few you have to remember. Really common ones, and the three you need to know are hydrochloric acid, okay, which is HCl. If you use hydrochloric acid to make your salt, you actually make a chloride. So every time you use hydrochloric acid to make your salt, you make a chloride. This means if I was to use sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, that would be this reaction, acid plus base, it would give me salt plus water. The salt would be sodium chloride if I was to use that acid and that alkali or base. Another acid we need to know is sulfuric acid. Which is actually H2SO4. If you use sulfuric acid to make your salt, it will actually end up with sulfate at the end of it. So, again, to use the example of sodium hydroxide plus sulfuric acid, it would make sodium sulfate uh, as the salt. That would be the name of the salt and water. And last of all, the other one is nitric acid. If you were to use nitric acid to make your salt, the salt you are going to produce is called a nitrate. Okay. So, using the same example, if we were to add sodium hydroxide to nitric acid, we would get sodium nitrate. Okay. So the end of the salt, the end of the name, comes from what acid? Hydrochloric makes chloride. Sulfuric acid makes sulfates, and nitric acid makes nitrates. That naming of salts is actually quite a tricky thing to get your head around, but there's usually only one or maybe two mark questions on it where they would say something like, name the acid you would use to produce copper sulfate. And if it's copper sulfate and you're looking for the acid, it's sulfuric acid. Or name the uh, acid you would use to produce zinc nitrate. Then you would just say nitrate, I need nitric acid. Okay, so it's usually questions like that. One particular salt that you need to be aware of how you make it um, is uh, making copper sulfate crystals. Now, hopefully, you did this with your teacher uh, practically. It's a practical, they ask some questions about occasionally. Uh, it's actually done by reacting copper oxide, which is a base. Uh, so, copper oxide is the name of the base. and it's a black solid that doesn't dissolve very well in water and they actually add that black solid to uh, sulfuric acid. Now the name of the metal stays the same, so copper and because it's sulfuric acid it actually makes copper sulfate. This is a blue solution originally, so you get a blue solution uh, produced. Now that blue solution uh, 
will actually have some copper oxide left in it. So you actually add your copper salt, uh, your sulfuric acid to your copper oxide and you heat it gently. You will then need to remove any copper oxide that has not reacted. And you do that by filtering. So you pass it through a filter paper and you collect the solution that's produced. That solution contains copper sulfate uh, in water. So copper sulfate solution. And it's blue in colour. You then need to get the copper sulphate crystals out of the solution. And the second part to it is you actually get those out by crystallisation. You heat the solution in an evaporating basin until it just starts to form crystals. And then you will leave it, probably on the windowsill, uh, for a day, maybe two days, until the crystals have formed in your evaporating basin. Okay? So... That's how you make copper sulfate crystals. Okay. The last thing just with making salts is occasionally in the chemical reactions you have what's called state symbols. They tell you what state the different substances are. You get brackets S after chemicals. That means it is solid. L means it's liquid. And no prizes for guessing what G means. It means it's a gas. Okay. If you've got S, a solid, liquid, or gas, uh, depending on what state symbol it's given. The other one that's a bit tricky is AQ, and AQ stands for aqueous. And that means a solution in water. Okay, so that's what you're looking for if you've got AQ. Now, one key term I'm just going to go over just before I move on is precipitate. A precipitate is a solid that forms in a solution. So if I did a reaction and I combine two aqueous uh, substances, they could be two salts. You can actually mix two salts together in solution, uh, aqueous salts, and they make a precipitate. A solid salt is formed. So I would be able to tell that by the fact I've mixed two things that are AQ and I've produced something that has an S in it, it's a solid. And by a precipitate, when you get that solid, it makes the solution go all cloudy. Little particles in there of a the solid make it go cloudy. It's called a precipitate. So you can actually form an insoluble, which means does not dissolve, salt, by mixing two soluble, in solution, aqueous salts together, and forming a precipitate. And it's quite a tricky thing, but it's actually just a, a small bit of it. But this making copper sulfate is something you could be asked about, the method to make copper sulfate crystals. Okay? By mixing copper oxide with sulfuric acid, heating it gently, filtering the excess copper oxide off, and then using crystallisation to get the copper sulfate crystals from the copper sulfate solution. Okay. Linked to salts is electrolysis. The reason it's linked is because you actually carry out electrolysis on uh, salts, ionic compounds. The definition of electrolysis is the splitting of a substance using electricity. Now, the substance you are splitting is called the electrolyte. That's the substance you split. And it actually takes place usually like this, in a beaker, uh, where you have two electrodes. I'm going to draw it up here a bit bigger. Okay, so there's my beaker, and I've got an electrode there, an electrode here, and I have a power supply of some kind up here. Okay. Now, in my beaker, I have a solution, and that solution is of an ionic salt, uh, and that's called the electrolyte. It's the substance that's being split uh, that's in the beaker. And in there, there will be ions, so different ions. Now, I'm going to use uh, copper chloride as my example. So I've got copper chloride in here. So I, with copper chloride, I have copper ions. Now, copper is 2 plus, and you'll be given the ions, or should be for elements like copper, and chlorine ions, which are 1 minus. Now, for every 
chlor uh, copper, there must be two chlorines uh, to make the charges balance, the two negatives balance out the two plus on the copper. And what's going to happen when I start to pass electricity through my circuit, uh, one of the electrodes is going to be positive and one is going to be negative. The copper ions, which are positive, are going to be attracted to the negative electrode. Okay? Why? Because opposites attract. These are called electrodes. One is positive and one is negative. They do actually have names, but in the GCSE you don't actually need to name them. Uh, so copper 2 plus, because it's positive, it's going to be attracted to the negative uh, electrode over here. Um, when that's attracted, something's going to happen to it. Okay? Uh, we've got the negative ions attracted here. Uh, if the camera moves slightly, yeah. So we've got light coming in, so I don't know if that's disrupting the uh, the feed slightly. So we're trying to move the camera at the moment. Hopefully. Uh, you won't lose me too much, you won't disrupt too much. Mm. It's the trouble with the summer, it's too sunny outside, and that's why we don't want to be here doing exams really, but hopefully uh, you can still see okay. Otherwise, what we might have to do is some way block out the light coming through the window, I don't know, but hopefully it's a bit better for now. Um, right. So we've got our copper, which is positive, attracted to the negative electrode. And we have our chlorine, which is negative, attracted to the positive electrode, because opposites attract each other. When they get there, something actually happens to them. Okay? Now, electrolysis has to be carried out on molten substances or aqueous solution. If it's a a molten substance, it means just copper chloride that's been melted, there's going to be a reaction there. And the reaction is actually going to produce uh, copper metal. So copper metal actually forms around this electrode. Uh, and the way it does it is the copper ions that actually go there, so Cu2+, they actually end up gaining electrons. So electrons are added. In fact, two electrons are added. And that cancels out the positive charge, and you actually end up with copper metal forming. Okay, so this is happening at the positive, uh, sorry, negative electrode. So at the negative electrode, this minus with a VE is just another way of saying negative. So negative electrode. That's what's taking place. Copper two plus joins with two electrons to give copper. Metal, that's an S by the way, very badly drawn. At the positive electrode, what actually happens is the chlorine that's been attracted there, in fact, as you see, there's two chlorines, so two Cl minuses actually need to lose electrons okay, to actually react. And when they lose electrons, they actually become chlorine gas, which is given off. And when they go off, they give off two electrons. So two electrons are lost okay, at that point. Again, we're still trying to adjust the camera. The light's coming around. Uh, we may have to move the tables if it's really an issue, if you can't see. Uh, can we not see at all? Better. <laughs> right. Or we can get up there and someone will have to put something in front of it. Right. Right. Well, so the positive electrode, uh, these negative, co uh, negative chlorines are attracted and uh, it loses electrons, so it gives that electrons to become chlorine gas. Okay? So chlorine gas is produced there. When that occurs, we can actually describe what's going on there. There's a really important thing to remember in electrolysis, it's called oil rig. So oil rig, it's a little acronym. It stands for oxidation is loss and reduction is gain of electrons. That's what it's talking about. So this copper that has gained electrons has actually been reduced. And this chlorine, which has lost electrons, 
has actually been oxidised. Okay, oil rig. Oxidation is loss. Apologies if that's a bit small. And reduction is gain. If you get a question, a really simple, short one marker is, how can you tell this substance has been oxidised? You just have to think oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons. And if you get a question, how do you know this substance has been reduced? It's gained electrons, is always the answer it's looking for. They might ask you it in the other way. How can you tell uh, this substance, oh sorry, this substance has gained electrons, what's happened? It has been reduced, or reduction. This substance has lost electrons, how can you tell what's happened? Oxidation, or it's been oxidised. Okay, oil rig, a really good little tip to remember, oil rig. So this is in electrolysis. Positive ions go to the negative electrode. Negative ions go to the positive electrode. When the positive ions get there, they gain electrons and are reduced. And when the negative ions get to the positive electrode, they lose electrons and are oxidised. You can tell they lose electrons because it releases them, and that's why they're over this side. This is what happens if it takes place on a molten solutions. It gets a little bit trickier if it takes place in aqueous solutions, which is dissolved in water. To do that, you have to look in the reactivity series. If the substance is less reactive than hydrogen in your reactivity series, uh, then you're okay. It will produce the pure metal. So copper is below uh, hydrogen in the reactivity series, so copper metal will be formed in an electrolysis of copper chloride solution. But if your metal is more reactive, sodium is right up the top of the reactivity series, the substance that will be produced at the negative electrode is hydrogen gas. If the metal is higher up the reactivity series than hydrogen, instead of producing the metal at the negative electrode, it will produce hydrogen gas. That's more tricky. If they're doing it on aqueous solutions, water solutions, electrolysis, if their electrolyte is dissolved in water, it makes the electrolysis more tricky to actually understand. Um, molten solutions, it just produces whatever's there, so copper and chlorine gas. Some specific uses of electrolysis you need to know. Okay? And electrolysis is one of the toughest sub subjects that comes up. It is the splitting of a substance uh, using electricity. And some common uses that come up in exams, GCSE exams, is the electrolysis of brine. Now brine is just a fancy way, way, way of saying sodium chloride solution. Or maybe a less fancy way, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, electrolysis of brine, electrolysis of sodium chloride solution. Brine is seawater or salt water, they put tuna in it in cans. Uh, sodium chloride, salt solution. And there are three things that are made from it. So when you do electrolysis of brine, you actually make chlorine gas is produced. So chlorine gas is one of the substances that's produced at, just as we saw, it's produced at the positive electron, chlorine gas. And that's useful because it can be used for bleach and to make plastics, chlorine gas. At the positive electrode, because sodium is so reactive, you actually get, uh, sorry, at the negative electrode, you get hydrogen gas released. And hydrogen gas can be used as a fuel, a rocket fuel, or a fuel for some cars, uh, but it can also be used to harden oils uh, into spritz. Uh, we learnt that in C1. And then the other really useful substance that's made from this process, electrolysis of brine, is sodium hydroxide, which is used to produce soap. So three important substances made by electrolyzing brine, electrolyzing sodium chloride solution. Chlorine gas at the uh, positive electrode, hydrogen gas at the negative electrode, and sodium hydroxide solution in the beaker afterwards, those three substances. Another use of electrolysis you'll need to know is purification of aluminium. I don't have time to go into the, the full details of it, but the summary of it is the fact that aluminium oxide is actually mined from the ground. You receive it by digging it out the ground. They then mix it with cryolite, and cryolite, you don't need to know what it is, but it lowers the melting point uh, of, of aluminium oxide. 
uh, on the side to put boiling point, which it does do, but it's actually the melting point that's important. So it lowers the melting point of aluminium oxide. Okay, um, That's important because aluminium oxide doesn't usually melt to about 2,000 degrees Celsius, whereas when it's mixed with cryolite, it brings it down to just under 1,000 degrees Celsius, which may still sound high, but saves a lot of money because it saves a lot of energy not having to heat it up that much. So mixed with cryolite to lower the melting point, and then they do electrolysis on that, that molten solution of uh, aluminium oxide. Pure aluminium is collected at the negative electrode because aluminium is a metal, so it will be positive, and it's attracted to the negative electrode, so it goes there. Okay? Uh, what's called the half equation, which is what these are, uh, for that reaction, if it did come up, would be your aluminium, 3 plus, gaining three electrons to become aluminium metal. Okay. And at the positive electrode, the oxygen is attracted to it, because aluminium oxide is aluminium with oxygen, and it will be produced there as a gas. But the electrodes are made of graphite fusion. So if I go back to my electrolysis, the electrodes themselves are made of graphite generally. Because, as we said earlier, graphite conducts electricity, but graphite is generally unreactive, so it doesn't react. We say inert. So the electrodes are usually made of graphite because the graphite is inert and it conducts electricity, as we know. When uh, you do electrolysis of aluminium to purify it, because the oxygen is produced at such a high temperature, it actually reacts with the graphite electrode. Graphite, remember, is a form of carbon and produces carbon dioxide. So the electrodes themselves wear away and they have to be replaced every so often uh, because the carbon dioxide escapes as a gas and the electrodes wear down. So you have to replace the electrodes. Okay? So that's purification of aluminium in basic detail. I haven't gone into too much detail on it. And last of all is electroplated. So electroplated is where you actually cover a metal with a thin coat, a thin layer of another metal. And there are several reasons you can do that actually. Some of them can be to make it stronger, to improve its appearance. So if you want to make gold plated jewellery, uh, you will coat it in a very thin layer of gold. You could protect it from corrosion, so protect it from uh, like Rusting is essentially what corrosion is, but that's only specific to iron, but just uh, getting damaged by oxygen in the air. And you can do it to save metal. Gold is a precious metal, so you could coat a thin layer on the outside so that it actually uh, looks a lot better, improves the appearance, but uh, it saves some of the gold metal. You're not using up as much gold. That's called electroplating. You, you, you actually put the, the thing you want to coat, in this example it's a spoon, as the negative electrode and then the metal that's in solution will be attracted to it and it will form a coat around it. The only extra trick to electroplating is to do with the current. If you do it with a high current, so a large current, which is the flow of electricity running through it, you will get a thick coat of metal really quickly but the metal will be weakly held, it will rub off. If you rub that spoon, the metal that you've plated on it, in this case silver, will just rub off. Whereas if you do it with a low current, it will take a lot longer to electroplate, but it will be tougher, the coating, it will be better held, and it will be longer lasting. So that's something they do occasionally ask about. High current, thick coat, but rubs off easily, like Low current, a thin coat, takes a long time, but is held more firmly. Okay? So that's electrolysis and some of the specific uses uh, of electrolysis. Um, I'm going to go on to rates and uh, pretty much finish off with a bit of rates and then a few little, little bits and pieces at the end. We have about, well, just under 15 minutes to go. Uh, and like I say, I'll do a bit on rates and uh, a few other little bits and pieces tidied up at the end. So the rate of a reaction is the speed at which a reaction takes place. So the rate is the speed of a chemical reaction, really, is what you're looking at. You can calculate it using a simple formula. It's actually the amount of reactant used up or the amount of product produced 
divided by time. <coughs> so amount of product I'll go for. Divided by time in a second. Okay. That's how you could calculate the rate. Now, they don't often ask you to calculate it, but that's how you would. Uh, more often you'd get a graph, like this one on the board, which shows you uh, a rate changing. So it would be the amount of product produced along here and time along the, the bottom. And it will be a curve that goes up like that and then starts to level out. Uh, the steepness of that curve, how steep it is, is actually the rate of reaction. It's called the gradient of the line. The steeper the line, the faster the rate of reaction uh, is what you're looking at. You need to know several ways to experimentally measure rate of reaction, and they can ask you about these experiments. The first one is collecting a volume of gas. I'll go over here. Okay. You would put a reaction inside a conical flask. Uh, that could be carbon, uh, sorry, chalk or marble chips, uh, calcium carbonate, and you would add an acid such as hydrochloric acid. That produces carbon dioxide gas, and you can collect that gas using a gas syringe. You can measure the amount of given, gas given off over time by using a stopwatch, and then you can use that to plot a graph um, and work out the rate of reaction. Okay? So that's one way you can measure the rate of reaction, the volume of gas given off, in an amount of time. Another way is from a colour change. You could measure the colour change. And a classic experiment for this is called the disappearing cross. You actually put a cross on a bit of paper underneath a reaction which produces a precipitate. It goes cloudy because a solid forms in the reaction. Uh, that precipitate is actually a precipitate of sulphur. So sulphur, and it may smell as well. It might produce a smell but it's actually sulphur that is produced in the reaction uh, of, of sodium thiosulfate and hydrochloric acid of two chemicals. You can time how long it takes for that solution to go cloudy, and that would be the rate of reaction, i.e. the cross disappears. You can no longer see the cross anymore. And last way to measure a rate of reaction experimentally is to do the reaction on top of a balance. Uh, and if you do it on top of a balance, you can measure the amount of mass that is lost over time. How would mass be lost in a reaction? Because those of you who remember core chemistry will say mass is conserved, the mass stays the same. Well, it's because the mass isn't truly lost. What it is is a gas is given off. So if you're producing carbon dioxide gas or hydrogen gas, that will leave. You put a cotton wool bung in the top to stop any of liquid escaping or any solid escaping and the gas can pass through it and it means that it will lose weight or lose mass because it's actually losing a gas. And again, you can time it to see how long it takes. So those are three ways experimentally you can measure the rate of reaction. The volume of gas produced, the time it takes for a cross to disappear or a solution to go cloudy or a colour change, or the amount of mass uh, that's lost over time in a reaction. When you're talking about rates, you need to link it to what's called collision theory. Now, this is what collision theory is. It is that chemical reaction can only occur when particles collide with each other. They have to bump into each other, and they have to have enough energy to react. The minimum amount of energy required to react is called the activation energy. Now, whenever you're describing the effects of different changes on rate of reaction, you must mention collisions or energy, sometimes both. Okay? And I'm going to go through some very specific factors that affect rate of reaction and how they do it based on collision theory. Reactions only occur when particles collide with each other with enough energy, sufficient energy, to react. The amount of energy they need is called the activation energy. The factors that affect rate of reaction, and these are the experiments you could do to see how much these change the rate of reaction. Surface area. Surface area, what that means is we actually break the particles up into smaller pieces. By doing that, you increase surface area. That means the amount of surface available for collision. Okay? If you increase the amount of surface available for collision, it means that particles will collide more often or more frequently. 
you have to say more often or more frequently. You cannot get marks for just saying more collisions. It's collide more often or more frequently. Okay? So if you split a substance up into smaller pieces, you increase its surface area. And therefore, you allow it to collide with the substance that's reacted with more frequently. So that's surface area. We've talked about collision, so we know we've done it. The next one is really two, concentration and pressure, but they are linked. It doesn't matter if the question's asking about concentration or pressure, they are kind of the same thing. Increasing the concentration or pressure means you've increased the number of particles in the same volume. So if that was this classroom that I'm in now, if we had 10 people in here and we all ran about, we would bump into each other. If we had 50 people in the room, we would collide with each other more often. We have increased the concentration of people in the room. Uh, so concentration and pressure, they're the same thing really. You're increasing the number of particles in the same volume, therefore particles will collide more often. And last of all is temperature. And this makes a big difference because it does two things. When you increase the temperature, you give the particles more energy. And when you give the particles more energy, that allows them to move faster. If they're moving faster, they're going to collide more often. Uh, that's like if we walked about the room, we would collide with each other every so often. If we ran about the room, we would collide more often. But not only that, so it means collisions more often, it also means that the collisions are more successful. Because they have more energy, they're more likely to have the activation energy. So they're more likely to react when they do collide. My top tip for talking about why factors that affect rate of reaction change the rate of reaction is, is you need to talk about collisions. And if you're looking at it on a graph, they'll look like this. So the amount of substances produced will be the same. The volume of oxygen in this experiment stays the same. But this one in blue has a slower rate than the one in red because the line is steeper. But it reaches the same point. Okay? It doesn't go any higher because there's the same amount of substance in the reaction. If you're to do an experiment to test any one of these factors, you need to keep the other factors the same. So if you're testing surface area, you need to keep concentration and pressure the same, and you need to keep temperature the same. Similarly, if you want to test temperature, you must keep the concentration of everything, or the pressure of the gases the same, or the surface area of the substance the same. So remember that for experiments. And the last way to change a rate of reaction is catalysts. Catalysts are something that speed up the rate of reaction without being changed themselves. They don't change the number of collisions. Particles still collide the same amount of times. But what they do is they lower the amount of energy needed for a reaction to take place. The activation energy, if you like. They lower the activation energy. Okay? And because they lower the activation energy, you're, you don't have to put as much energy into the reaction. And that's good for people because they can make their product faster. So in industry, they like to talk about why would you use a catalyst in industry. You can make the product faster, but you can save energy. And by saving energy, that saves you money. So it means more profit for the company. Okay? With catalysts, it still... It still follows that if you increase the surface area of catalysts, so like in a catalytic converter, they have a thin layer of catalyst in a honeycomb in the catalytic converter, because if you increase the surface area of the catalyst, it increases the rate even more. Um, catalysts, the downsides to them is they're often precious metals that cost a lot, like palladium and platinum. But that doesn't matter because you can use it again because it's not changed itself. So you can use it again and again. And you only need a small amount to make a very, very big difference. Okay. Uh, so the graphs would look like this. The graph, if you increase the rate, it's going to be a steeper line but level out at the same point. So if I was to do one for temperature just quickly, okay, this would be the volume of gas produced. This would be the time along here. Um, if I did it at a cold temperature, my line may look like this. Okay, and if I was to describe the graph, I would say the reaction starts uh, increasing and then levels out, and the reaction is complete when it goes level. There's no more reaction. 
Whereas if I did it at a high temperature, the line would be a lot steeper, but it would still level out at the same point. Okay, this would be at a higher temperature, a faster rate of reaction. The reaction begins rapidly and then starts to slow down and eventually comes to a stop. We are very close to the end. There were a few things I wanted to touch on uh, just before we did. So really, really quickly, rush for a few more things just to get the maximum out of it. Uh, I know you've waited this long, so the last few bits. Uh, exon endothermic reactions. Exothermic are reactions that give out energy. The energy exits the reaction. Uh, and they cause the temperature to go up. An example would be burning. And the uses of it could be in self-heating cans or hand warmers, the little chemical packets you can break, put into your gloves, and they warm up and get your hands warm. That's an exothermic. Exo means to exit, to give out, so energy is given out, and thermic means heat. The temperature goes up. Exothermic gets hotter. Whereas endothermic is the opposite. Endo to enter, okay, to go inside. Uh, they take energy in. So that actually causes the temperature to go down and it gets colder. So an endothermic reaction gets colder. It's easy to identify because the temperature goes down. Whereas an exothermic reaction, the temperature goes up. An example of the use of that would be those cold injury packs you might get from the nurse that you break, the chemicals mix and it gets cold and you can put on an, in, uh, an injury like to, to reduce the swelling. And reversible reactions, okay, reversible reactions, it's this symbol that actually means reversible. What that actually means, a reversible reaction, is it can go forwards and it can go backwards. The reactants can make the products and the products can make the reactants. If the forward reaction, is, which is what we call this, is endothermic, the backwards reaction must be exothermic. And the amount of energy absorbed or taken in going forwards is the same as the amount of energy released going backwards. Okay? A specific example is copper sulfate. So hydrated copper sulfate is blue, and when it reacts, given like warmed up, endothermic, it actually uh, goes to white copper sulfate, anhydrous, which literally anhydrous means without water, and releases water. And then, if you add water to white copper sulfate, and hydrous copper sulfate, it actually gives out heat, so it gets warmer, heats up, and becomes blue copper sulfate. It's a common test for water. Okay. Percentage yield is the last thing I'll have time to go over. This equation you're not given, but to work out the percentage yield, that's the amount you make of a reaction based on how much you should have made. Uh, you do the amount you actually make divided by the amount you should have made. Okay? Times 100 to get it a percentage. So if I was doing a reaction and I was supposed to make uh, 100 grams of product, I was trying to make 100 grams, but when I did it, I actually only got uh, 50 grams produced. It actually would mean my percentage yield, to work it out, I would do percentage yield is equal to the amount I did make, 50 grams, divided by the amount I should have made, 100 grams, times 100, which is actually 50%. No percentage yield should be over 100%. If you get over 100%, you've probably got these numbers the wrong way around, so try it again, swap them over. And the reason you never get 100%, and they may ask you, is some reaction may be incomplete, not go to completion. Uh, some of the product might be lost when you're pouring it out, you never get it all out of the beaker, so some is lost in the apparatus. There's unwanted reactions which make different products that you don't want, impurities they're called, or the reaction could be reversible and the reaction goes back to the reactants from the product. Didn't talk about polymers, so it's on the PowerPoint. If you download the PowerPoint, you'll be able to see the information about that, thermosetting and thermosoftening. Nanoparticles, really all you need to know is they are tiny particles, about 1 to 100 nanometers big. Or if you want to be really clever, 10 to the minus 9 meters, or a few atoms big. They have a really large surface area to volume ratio, which makes them useful as catalysts, and they are used as drug delivery uh, devices or strengthening, this is called a carbon nanotube, you could be asked about. 
And last of all, I'll leave it up, but I really have got to finish, is to analyse substances. You could do paper chromatography, which is used to look at dyes and food additives. It works based on the solubility. Gas chromatography, which is this setup here, where you separate substances in this column inside an oven. And then mass spectrometry, which is just a clever way of weighing substances, molecular uh, substances, and getting their molecular weight. The parent iron peak is the same as the relative formula mass. Thanks very much for joining uh, me tonight and uh, hopefully you got what you wanted out of the video. Um, as I say I'll be in tomorrow morning um, from 7 o'clock in this room 104 uh, to go for any questions you've got. If you have got anything to ask me about empirical formula, reactive masses, um, then please do come along um, and ask me those questions or anything that I did kind of rush through at the end if you want to ask me anything about that because uh, there's so much in these in these exams now and I'm trying to get through it all, please do come along and I might see you tomorrow. Otherwise, good luck.